companies, woke companies, are sort of quasi-controlled by the government in a way that Bitcoin never will be. And, uh, and in that sort of a world, um, I, I would submit that perhaps the, the way we should think of the Bitcoin to equity ratio, you know, the, the benchmark for Bitcoin is not gold, but equities. And the question is, why can't there be parity between Bitcoin and equities? Why, why shouldn't we be talking about something more like 100 to 1? Which, of course, won't, won't, be, won't be as good as it sounds because um, the fiat money will be worth a lot less and it'll be taxed pretty heavily and, and whatnot. But I think, um, but I'm, I'm still hopeful that if uh, Bitcoin goes up by a factor of 100, you will, uh, you'll make um, some money, a modest amount of money in, uh, in real terms. Um, now, you know, there, there are sort of, um, at, at the very minimum, what I think, um, you know, it's always hard to know where Bitcoin goes from here. It's $43,000 today, where does it, where does it go? Um, what, I, what I like to say is that uh, Bitcoin is always the most honest market in the world. It's the most efficient market. And it, it, was, it was the canary in the coal mine. It was telling us that the inflation was coming in the last uh, two years as it went from five, 6,000 uh, up by you know, a factor of 10x. It, it is telling us that the central banks are bankrupt, that we are, we are at the end of the fiat money regime. And that's sort of, uh, that's sort of what, it has, what it has priced in. I think the central bankers, Mr. Powell, people like that, should be extremely grateful to Bitcoin because um, it's, it's the last warning they're going to get. They are, they, they are, they've chosen to ignore it um, and, um, and they will have to you know, pay the consequences for that in, in the years ahead. But let me, um, let me ask, let me, uh, let me come back to this question. Um, why, why has Bitcoin not uh, yet gone to 100,000 to a million dollars of Bitcoin why has it not yet converged with gold or, um, or even with the equity markets more broadly? And what, what, is, what is going to, you know, what is, what is it going to take for this, for this to happen? And, uh, you know, I, I know that sort of the ways we often talk about um, businesses or technologies is, you know, how, how great the technology is, how great the code is, how great the math is, uh, you know, how, 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 how it's sort of, innovative, but I, I want to sort of suggest that we should maybe think of, we should think of, um, we, we should think of it at least in one dimension as sort of a political question. And it's a, it's a movement and it's a political question whether this movement is going to um, succeed or whether, um, whether the enemies of the movement are going to succeed in stopping us. And, uh, and so I want to maybe end with, um, you know, an enemies list a list of people who I think are stopping Bitcoin. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, they all have, many of them have, there's sort of a lot, lot of them, they tend to have the sort of nameless, faceless, bureaucrat perspective, which is, of course, one of the ways they hide. Um, but I'm gonna, we're gonna try to, try to expose them and, uh, and, and realize that, uh, that this is sort of what we have to fight for, uh, for Bitcoin to go 10x or 100x from here. So, um, enemy number one. I, I think he sort of, um, I, I, I think the sort of the, the sociopathic uh, grandpa from Omaha is, um, is um, you know, uh, is, is perhaps the most honest and the most direct in it. Um, and, um, and you have to sort of think of, it's, it's, it's of course, on some level, these people are always just talking their book. It's sort of, they have some sort of institutional bias. Uh, it's long, you know, a list of woke companies. It's, 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 it's somehow long, this, um, this uh, fiat money system. And, um, and of course, um, if, the, if it was, if it, if the, you know, there's always a sense if you're a, if you're a money manager, you want to pretend that it's complicated to invest. And uh, if, if, if all you have to do is buy Bitcoin, you know, that's, that's like, that's like ridiculous. All these people are out of business. You know, it's a, uh, I mean, there was a version of this also with gold. They never liked gold either, because if all you had to do was own gold, um, that's something everybody can do. Um, but uh, the, the, there is something, there's sort of an institutional bias, a, a um, sort of a um, center-left political bias. Um, you know, there's of course, um, there's of course the, um, um, there's of course the New York City uh, banker bias, um, Jamie Dimon, JP Morgan, you can get quotes like this from, from any n number of these people. 
Uh, and then, then I would say, um, you know, another, uh, another one, even more obscure, Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, where, um, you know, uh, if, if you have these sort of large institutional investors, um, they need to be allocating some of their money to Bitcoin. When they manage state pension funds in the U.S., or, 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 or they, they get trillions of dollars in assets, when they choose not to allocate to Bitcoin, that is a deeply political choice, and we need to be pushing back on them. We need to say, you know, um, you, have to, you have to get on board on this. And um, the, um, the, the, the Larry Fink quote is sort of a rep representative, I think, of a whole genre of anti-Bitcoin uh, things where, uh, you know, um, and you, you have to always put it in some context, but pro-blockchain, pro-blockchain is an anti-Bitcoin term, very typically. So it's like, I love the blockchain, but, you know, not so sure about this Bitcoin, don't need Bitcoin, we can move on to the blockchain, move along, this is not, you know, not the currency you're looking for, move along, move along. And, um, and uh, but, you know, and if we sort of combine um, all of these things, you know, I, I would sort of put, put the label on, um, on the sort of, uh, you know, on, on the sort of, um, uh, the, the, the label they've come up with, and perhaps the real enemy is uh, ESG. Um, and, um, and which, you know, I, 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 you know, it's always sort of unclear what it means. You know, um, it, you might think of it as not charitable for me to sort of name some enemies here, but I, I think that ESG is just a hate factory. It's a factory for naming enemies, and uh, we should not be allowing them to do that. Or, um, or that, you know, of course, you can, you can sort of always ask the question, you know, what's the difference between ESG and CCP, the Chinese Communist Party? You know, they are, they are into social and governance. Um, you know, environmental is sort of fake. Uh, it's probably also fake in a lot of these cases. But, uh, but I always think when you think ESG, you should be thinking CCP. Um, and um, and the, there's, some, there's some degree, um, you know, and, the, and it, it's, it's been a surprise, you know, ESG has been surprisingly inclusive. You know, basically, as far as I can tell, the only, the only things that are sort of not liked are, you know, some of the, some of the carbon industries and then, um, and then Bitcoin. And uh, it's because most of the other companies, you know, they are, they are subject to political control, especially when, they, when, when your companies go public. I, you know, I always, I, I always advise uh, CEOs when, when they take their companies public, you know, there's some good things, you get liquidity, you, you can, you know, the early investors can cash out, um, um, it, you can get some credibility. But um, it's basically taking a company public, it's a, it's a de facto government takeover where, where some people uh, who are effectively government bureaucrats became more empowered. It's the, the, the CFO, the general counsel, the accountants, the lawyers, the, uh, you know, the HR people, all these sort of extensions of the state um, are given more power. Uh, and, uh, and we have to think of ESG as sort of this, this vast um, umbrella thing. And, uh, and, and we're, you know, sort of one of the, one of the um, great features of Bitcoin, and it's always a question whether it's a bug or a feature, but I would submit that in the sort of more heavy-handed uh, statist world, it is far more of a feature than a bug, is that Bitcoin is not a company. It does not have a board. Um, we do not know who Satoshi is. Um, and, uh, and in some ways, all these things seemed extreme in the world of the 2010s where, you know, the inflation was low, the regulations were, were, were not the worst, um, and it seems, uh, seems extremely prescient for the world of the 2020s. And uh, if we had to summarize this in, in uh, one frame, it is, um, it is, it is the, ger the, the finance gerontocracy that runs the country through um, whatever, um, you know, whatever uh, silly virtue signaling slash hate factory term like ESG they have um, versus what I would call, you know, what, 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 what we have to think of as a, as a revolutionary youth movement. And, uh, and we have to just go out from this, this conference and, uh, and take over the world. Thank you very much. Welcome back. We're here at the Marathon News Desk at Bitcoin 2022, presented by Bitcoin Magazine. I'm Pete Rizzo, editor of Bitcoin Magazine. We're back with our panel, Mr. Mark Moss, Kevin O'Leary, and Nolan Bowerly. First, like and smash that subscribe button. You just watched a keynote by entrepreneur, investor, and philanthropist Peter Thiel 
co-founder of PayPal. This was high production. He led with a video of himself as a youth saying things about money that we say about Bitcoin today, uh, throwing money into the crowd, but also doing some other things, comparing Bitcoin to Ethereum, uh, saying that Bitcoin is too slow, uh, saying that the competitor to Bitcoin is the S&P, uh, making a lot of statements here, also saying uh, being pro-blockchain is anti-Bitcoin. Where do you guys want to start with this speech? Let, let me take a stab at it, go back to the beginning <laughs> of the presentation. Yeah. Uh, the one that I found most interesting was comparing Bitcoin valuation or total market cap to that of the S&P 500. Now, the, the reason that's a difficult comparison uh, at this point is, the S&P 500 is primarily owned by sovereign wealth and pension plans. Mm. Uh, when you have $250 million a day to put to work, the only place you can find liquidity of that size is the S&P 500. It's the largest market on earth, represents the largest companies on earth, and is a store of value, even in inflationary times. Mm. The challenge with his analogy and asking why Bitcoin is not a challenger, because he showed the analogy at a period in time, gold market cap was equal to that of the S&P. That was very interesting, that mm. chart. Mm. Right now, there isn't a single pension plan or sovereign wealth fund that is allowed to buy Bitcoin. Mm. So if you want to see it compared to the S&P 500, which is what they buy all day long, 24-7, you have to set the playing field level, which means we need policy to allow pension plans, both sovereign wealth plans and domestic, mm. to buy Bitcoin as an asset. You can't do that yet. And in order for that to happen, you will have to get the government to agree and the SET to agree and the regulator to agree and the infrastructure that provides compliance and the ESG committees and the, mm -hmm. the ethical committees to agree to allow them to buy it. And we're a little ways off, but when that happens, you will see Bitcoin break out of its current trading range because it will be allocated and then it'll start to appreciate. So Kevin, I are you taking a positive take? Bitcoin equity is good comparison, Mark? Yeah, I want to uh, jump in. I mean, I would definitely agree with Mr. O'Leary on this, Mr. Wonderful. Um, it's, we're going to need a couple changes to happen, and when that when that change happens, they'll be coming in. But I think the big thing that I saw in that comparison, equity is 115 trillion, Bitcoin eight, 800 billion. I think what we're going to see is that because we've been in this inflationary monetary system, there's nowhere good to park your money. As Mr. O'Leary points out, you have $250 billion, what are you going to do with it? You have to put it in the S&P. That's the only place they could take that much money. When we have a better when we have a superior asset that we can put money into, it's going to pull monetary premium from other properties. So silver has industrial use, gold has a monetary premium. And I think we're going to see monetary premiums being sucked out of real estate, mm. being sucked out of the equities markets as well, mm. because Bitcoin will be that well, pristine asset. We're, we're running short on time here. We did say the dirty word, Ethereum. Reactions to the floor. Uh, what did you make of his comparison, Bitcoin Look, to Ethereum? I thought he got into trouble with those analogies. That's you know, Analogies can be really unpersuasive because it's so easy to see the right. holes in them. And, you know, Arthur Hayes, who I think is one of the best writers, entrepreneurs in this industry, he set that stage already for most of this industry and for me in particular when he mentioned that, okay, Ethereum has the potential to like take the Wall Street piece. Mm. Bitcoin really is, you know, something for savings, something for, for people to put their yeah. store about. Again, I think it was an attempt to pigeonhole Bitcoin yeah. in this world of crypto assets mm. to the floor for remarks. Well, what he got wrong in that comparison with Bitcoin and Ethereum is he pointed Bitcoin as a place to store value, but um, Ethereum has more velocity, so it's better of a medium of exchange. Mm. And he's got that completely wrong because Bitcoin is a new technology that allows us to have the superior value storage properties of Bitcoin, but also has the velocity of instantaneous and, and free mm. transfers. So it's both wrapped into one. We don't need two assets like we Used to. Before we wrap up, I just want to note, he did say a few other things that are positive. Central bankers should be grateful uh, to Bitcoin, saying that Bitcoin has these enemies, uh, the sociopathic grandpa from Omaha, Jamie Dimon, to the floor. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with making that comparison. However, that's not what Jamie Dimon said. Mm -hmm. He's saying, my clients want this, mm -hmm. and we're going to start to accommodate them. That's what we are. We're a bank if they want to buy the asset. Remember, Bitcoin is software. Ethereum is software. You can decide on your own which software provides more productivity, more cost savings, what Whatever you want, but it's just software. And if you if you are willing to invest in Microsoft or invest in Google, you're just investing in software too. Sure. So but at the end of the day, that's how you should look at it. Sure, but software is political, and that's where I thought he really found his pace in this in the whole talk. When he was really talking about it's a political choice, saying you're pro-blockchain is a political choice. Mm. It's not neutral, it's not technology. Bitcoin itself and You didn't agree with that. I certainly agreed with that. I, I think this whole thing is a worldview, and Bitcoin does offer a way to organize markets and see the whole world. It's not just about the asset. Certainly a lot to unpack, a lot to discuss, but unfortunately I have to throw it back to the main panel stage. We've got Bitcoin is Freedom coming up, moderated by Alice Gladstein, author of Check Your Financial Privilege. You can find that one on the bitcoinmagazine.com backslash store. Uh, keep it tuned here. Smash that like button. Uh, we'll be here all day on YouTube, bringing you the best from Bitcoin 2022 Miami.